So just a quick poll. Who here, by a show of hands, is wearing clothing? <laughs> I hope everybody raised their hand. If not, that's cool, too. Um, most of us on the planet wear clothing, right? And at least in Western cultures, most of us have a closet full of clothing. And that closet has a wide variety of types of clothing, too, from clothing it, that you might wear to work, clothing that you might wear to the gym, maybe you have a few formal options that you wear for weddings, what have you. Think about the last piece of clothing that you bought. For me, the last piece of clothing I bought was actually this weird dress thing. <laughs> I knew I needed to look nice in front of a large crowd of people, so I looked online, and as you can imagine, I found thousands of options. I settled on this dress, I picked my size, my color, and I ordered it. When it arrived, I tried it on, it looked great, it fit great. I really had no problems at all finding something to wear here today. I have a lot of options when I'm shopping for clothing because I am an average consumer. Now, most of us are average consumers. We can find a wide variety of clothing types whenever we want. Clothing is being made for us pretty much constantly. Even if you shop in a specialty section like plus size, petite, or big and tall, you're an average consumer because you have more options than the non-average consumer. So who are non-average consumers? Well, let's think about it. Who might not have such an easy time finding a wide variety of clothing types? People with physical impairments or disabilities sometimes do have a difficult time finding clothing. Think about the last time you went to a mall or a store. Can you recall seeing a pair of pants or really any, any article of clothing marketed specifically towards somebody, say, in a wheelchair? There are a few clothing companies that are doing great things as far as making and manufacturing clothing for non-average consumers, and that's a step in the right direction, but it's really not enough. One area that non-average consumers can have a really difficult time finding clothing is sportswear. Think about the last time you saw a sportswear advertisement. Do you recall seeing a non-average consumer? The truth is we don't see non-average consumers in these types of images too often. And beyond that, there's a real lack of product available for non-average consumers in sportswear as well. Now, to me, this seems pretty strange, because there are plenty of athletes and people who participate in sports that have some sort of physical disability. For example, the Paralympics showcased the extreme athleticism of thousands of athletes that might have some sort of disability or impairment, and thus they might be non-average consumers, and thus they might not have proper sportswear options available to them. So how do we make the clothing industry, and more specifically the sportswear industry, more inclusive? There's such a wide variety of clothing made for average consumers all the time. In fact, the clothing industry is one of the most wasteful and polluting industries in the world. So how do we solve this? And since I'm the one on this stage, you're probably wondering, how do I plan on solving this? Well, the truth is I can't solve this problem alone. I'm just one person, and the industry is a big, big industry. I used to work in the clothing industry. I used to work in New York in high fashion, making really expensive clothing for really tall and skinny models. And I decided I wanted to do something different, so I came back to grad school to focus on inclusive design in the clothing industry. But I really still can't solve this problem alone. So I decided to work with a Paralympic athlete. For the purpose of this talk, we'll call this athlete Hannah. Hannah is a Paralympic shooting athlete. She lives in Colorado Springs at the training base, and she uses a wheelchair. My work involved making custom sportswear for Hannah. But throughout this process, I was able to develop somewhat of a step-by-step -step guide that I think clothing industry leaders could utilize to start more easily making clothing for non-average consumers. So we'll start with step one. Step one is build a relationship. When you're designing for somebody who is different than you, building a relationship is one way to understand what they might need from their clothing. Building a relationship includes building trust and communication. In my work with Hannah, building a relationship was done in the, in the form of learning pretty much everything there was to know about her sport and her lifestyle. I went to visit her, I watched her compete. We even went to the mall a few times and got our nails done. All of these things were of value when understanding what Hannah might need from her clothing, which actually brings me to step two. Step two is understanding your consumer's needs and wants. These two things are two different things, and I'll give you an example. When I was a kid, I used to watch TV, like most of us, 
and I would see commercials for really cool toys, and I would say to my mom, I need that. And she would say, well, what you need and what you want are two different things. And she was absolutely right. I need my clothing to be comfortable, but I also want my clothing to be stylish. You might be the same or you might be different. Designers tend to have an understanding of what their consumer needs and sometimes also what their consumer wants. If a clothing company can put out a product that meets the needs and wants of their consumer, they're more likely to have highly satisfied consumers. Understanding Hannah's clothing needs and wants was done in the form of an interview. I sat down with her, I asked her questions about how her clothing helps her perform in her sport, what kinds of things might annoy her about her clothing, what her personal style is, and many more things. All of these things were of value when understanding what design I needed to come up with for Hannah's clothing. So this is the design that Hannah and I together settled on for her custom sportswear. And I know what you're probably thinking, what the heck is that? It doesn't look like sportswear at all. I'm not gonna get too much into it, but essentially, Paralympic shooting is an accuracy sport. Athletes tend to use these stiff, rigid, body-hugging jackets to help them gain body support where they, when they have to sit in this position for a long time, and thus they can gain better scores, better for performance. Athletes who shoot from a seated position need shorter jackets than athletes who shoot from a standing position. If this kind of stuff interests you, I would recommend that you look into this sport, but for our purpose here today, you don't really need to know all the details, just the steps that I took to make Hannah's custom clothing. So we'll move on to step three. Step three is arguably the most important step, understanding your consumer's body shape and size. So who here today has a favorite pair of blue jeans? Probably a lot of us, right? I know I do. And what makes them your favorite? It might be the way that they look, right? But more often, it's the way that they fit. Clothing companies tend to have an understanding of their consumers' body sizes, and they have a size chart that they use when they make and manufacture clothing. And these size charts kind of differ from company to company, which is why that pair of Levi's jeans might fit you better than that pair of, say, Wrangler jeans. But most companies tend to base their size charts on average consumers. But sometimes, average consumer body shape and size doesn't really work for non-average consumers. Imagine you're wearing that same pair of blue jeans, but you have to sit down all day. Things might start to feel a little weird. Your back waistband might start to ride down. The fabric under your knees might start to put some pressure on you, and a number of other things that you can imagine. These are just a few examples of the ways in which clothing for the average consumer doesn't necessarily work for the non-average consumer's body shape and size. So how do we understand body shape and size? Well, if you've ever gotten measured for a custom suit or a custom dress, you kind of know the drill. You stand in one spot, somebody comes with a tape measure, and they take however many measurements, and voila, they understand. That's actually a pretty tried and true way to understand those things, but we're living in 2020, and guess what, we have technology. So let me show you the ways that I use technology to understand Hannah's body shape and size. First, we did a 3D body scan. A 3D body scan is essentially a true to size 3D image of somebody's body, and it can give you so much more information than a tape measure alone could. Next, using that 3D body scan, I was able to make this half scale form of Hannah's body that I was able to use to continue to design and develop her custom jacket. Lastly, I was able to use a software program called Clo to virtually simulate her jacket onto her 3D body. Now, all of these technologies helped me immensely when I was working on Hannah's custom jacket. And they actually weren't that expensive to invest in. So clothing companies could potentially invest in these exact same things without much risk. In fact, a lot of clothing companies are exploring these exact same technologies right now. Another added benefit of using these technologies is that there were images to be able to send to Hannah as I was working, which actually brings us to step four. Step four in designing for the non-average consumer is sending updates and allowing for feedback. And this is something we kind of all do in our day-to-day -day shopping life. I know I do. So if you're anything like me, first of all, I'm really, really sorry. And second of all, you like to do research before you buy a product. You might compare prices, products, ratings, what have you. Eventually, eventually you might order something. You might track it until it comes to your door. When you get it, you might open it up, try it out, 
If you like it, you might leave a good review. If you don't like it, you might leave a bad review. If you paid a lot of money for that product or if it's a custom product made just for you, you're more likely to reach out to the company directly with any problems you have and hope that they fix it. In my work with Hannah, sending updates and allowing for feedback was done in the form of sending pictures, talking on the phone, going to visit, sending her prototypes. I think I provided her with more updates than she would have even liked. But it's better to be on the side of more communication than too little. Every step of the way, she was allowed to give feedback, and I listened to that feedback. Now, if you're hoping to see a finished jacket, I'm really sorry to disappoint you. I don't have it done yet. It needs to get done soon, because I plan to graduate in a few months, hopefully. <laughs> but once it's finished, I'm going to be bringing it to her, allowing her to try it out, and at that point, she can give as much feedback as she wants. If she doesn't like something or if something needs to be fixed, I plan on fixing it, which actually brings me to the last step. Step five is fix it. Fix the problems that your consumer has with your products. Actually, I think this is the way that the clothing industry should begin to operate more. Maybe if we fix the problems that consumers have, we can focus on quality of products over quantity of products. Imagine having one pair of perfect pants in your wardrobe as opposed to 10 pairs of mediocre pants. If we can focus on quality over quantity in the clothing industry, that might also allow us to free up some resources with those clothing industry professionals which may give them time and energy to be able to start making more clothing for the non-average consumers. So can my simple step-by-step -step guide really affect change in the clothing industry? That's really for the industry to, to decide. But you might be able to help. The next time you're in a mall or a store, you might ask yourself, do I see the non-average consumer represented here? It may be a slap of reality, but at any time, any of us could develop some sort of disability, so inclusive design really benefits all of us. It could even just be as simple as asking your boss why there's not a ramp in the office, and that's a step in the right direction. So my message to clothing industry leaders and sportswear industry leaders is this. I invite you to utilize my step-by-step -step guide and even make it better. I challenge you to hire non-average consumers at your company at the design level to start helping you make these products. And I urge you to create an industry with less waste and more inclusivity. Thank you.